So let us start in time because we have a lot of things to, uh, to discuss today. Um, my name is Georg Zachmann, I'm Senior Fellow at Bruegel on Energy and Climate Issues and I'm very pleased to have a great panel to discuss the question of how to make carbon pricing work. Um, I think it's a very topical question, as we'll see in the discussion, it's, uh, it's currently high on national agendas as well on the uh, European agenda. And let me start out with, uh, with some premise from, uh, uh, premises of the discussion from, uh, from our side, so that we don't have to, to start the discussion uh, at, the, at the very beginning, but can start where it starts to get interesting. So the premises are, we are all agree that essentially uh, climate change is a, is a big issue, needs to be tackled with, and it's one of the, uh, uh, one of the big economic and political challenges of uh, this mandate of the, of the new European Commission. And, um, of the, of the coming 10 years also in the member states. Uh, we all agree, I think, that a price on carbon is an indispensable tool to make this uh, energy and climate transition happening. And uh, we, I think, also all agree that the current approach that we, uh, that we have in Europe and in member states is insufficient and needs to be complemented. Uh, so something needs to be done and relatively quickly. Now, what we might not all agree on is the details of what needs to be done. So what is the implementation details of carbon pricing in Europe and beyond that we, uh, that we want to see that in our view are most effective to, uh, in an economically efficient way, reduce emissions and, uh, and stimulate our economies instead of hinder them. So. That's the sort of question we want to discuss here. We'll go through a list of, uh, of uh, six questions, hopefully, uh, on, on different design items and try to see a bit where people agree on the panel and, and with you and where there might be disagreements and interesting areas for, for further discussion. Um, I have, um, I think, the, the, the perfect panel for, uh, for this sort of discussion because we, uh, we have essentially an, uh, an actual policymaker, um, Mr. Jasper Wessling, who is Deputy Director General for Tax and Customs Policy and Legislation at the Ministry of Finance in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is currently discussing the introduction of a, uh, of a national carbon tax. Um, Mr. Wessling has a background in the political economy of protection, so otherwise he might have been in the, uh, in the other panel on trade policy. He, <laughs> he has, uh, has been head of the cabinet of the Minister of Economic Affairs, and since 2017 he is in the Ministry of Finance, uh, where the, the current discussions on a carbon tax are, uh, uh, are going on. Um, then to, to my right is uh, Brigitte Knopf. Uh, Brigitte is Secretary General of the Mercato Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change and she is one of the lead authors um, on the uh, fiscal chapter of the uh, UN Emission Gap Report um, and she is a very active participant, uh, she and her institute, in the German discussion on, uh, on carbon pricing which is currently in, uh, in full flow with discussions uh, along all those lines that we, that, we want, uh, that we want to speak about and Brigitte has also been a contributing author to, uh, uh, to I think several of the IPCC reports. Um, and then finally, uh, but, not, uh, but not least, uh, we have uh, Lapo Pistelli. Um, uh, Lapo essentially switched between all three things. He has been uh, somewhat in, uh, in, uh, uh, at the beginning in academia, but he has uh, been a policymaker. He has been member of the European Parliament, member of the Italian Parliament. He has been deputy minister for, for foreign affairs. And uh, he is now in, uh, in, in the corporate world in one of the biggest energy companies in Europe. And uh, so he will be uh, the one who is most affected maybe by, uh, by carbon prices or his companies. So his position will be very important to, uh, to hear too as well. So without further ado, I would like to, to start out by, um, by a question to, um, uh, uh, to Jasper Westling. Um, we have a... Kind of, we have a European emission trading system, and uh, we think that it's quite important to, to have it uh, to, to have similar carbon prices uh, across Europe. On the other hand, we have a lot of national approaches in uh, in carbon pricing, and the Netherlands being one of the uh, the countries that is currently thinking about introducing a national pricing system. What do you think? Should we should we try to go for the for the optimal European system, or should we try to have uh, suboptimal but more practical national systems? Uh, good morning, and thank you very much, Georg. Um, well, naturally, that, that 
that issue that you mentioned is um, as, as two sides. The first side is the theoretical side, uh, which is quite clear cut. Um, if you want really to do something for climate, um, and you have the, the focus on the ecological and economical facets, aspects, it's clear cut. You should do it on a supranational, preferably even global scale. Um, but as we all know, that's not always easy. It has been discussed in a plenary session uh, abundantly. So doing these things at a European level is a, a very good second best. Um, and we feel that um, much more should be done about that on the European level. And I think your co-writer, um, Simone, with a very difficult Italian last name, um, forward some proposals just, just now in the article uh, and also on stage um, that the scope of the European trading system uh, could be broadened, especially in this field of transportation, uh, that would make a lot of sense. Um, not only because emissions are rising at that, uh, in that field, in that sector, but moreover, because it's clearly one of the sectors where the arguments to do this in an international approach is, is most clear cut, because transportation naturally is cross-border. Um, and climate is a cross-border issue uh, in its effects, but it should also be a cross-border issue in its approach. Um, because then um, we will see that uh, not only households are affected by carbon pricing, but naturally also industry. Um, so let me say something about the other fields as well. Um, I think we should uh, enhance the European trading, uh, emission trading system of European Union, broadening it, and um, maybe uh, to stick also to the title of this conference, um, braver, greener, and fairer. I didn't know fairer was a word, but it, it means more fair. Um, if you stick to that motto, um, I think being braver is the only solution to actually becoming greener and more fair. Um, because if you don't do it on that level, um, you will have a lot of problems in the field of industry. That being said, um, it's clear that uh, Europe has been quite successful in uh, developing the targets uh, and the framework, uh, the, the training system, but not so much in its implementation. Uh, we have been, as member states, very cautious to, to leave the implementation to the European Union or even the European Commission, um, and have set on a course of national implementation. And even that is not second best. Um, I think it's third best, uh, because second best would be to collide with a number of member states that have similar ambitions and have similar economic structures. So therefore, I'm glad that currently the, the Dutch government is, um, has started talks with our neighboring uh, large country, uh, Germany. Just uh, two weeks ago, there were the first discussions on uh, a, common, a common climate approach. Within the Netherlands, um, we do not wait for these brave, bold steps of the European Union uh, and the negotiations with, with our German neighbor. Um, we also take national steps, as was mentioned in the introduction already. Um, we have identified five fields that are relevant, um, five sectors, I should say. And industry is a, a very large one. Um, the Production of electricity is another large one. Transportation, I mentioned already. Um, and we also have an approach in the field of agriculture um, and in construction and housing. But our carbon tax system that we will introduce as of January 1st, 2021, will really apply um, only in the field of industry, which is, uh, I think, one of the most difficult ones, uh, considering all the aspects of competition, level playing field, etc. Um, but we have managed to work out uh, a, a system, which we might go into later on, um, that has 
struck a balance between uh, the ecological ambitions and goals that we set and we hope uh, to remain economically sound and competitive. Um, so that's a long introduction, but to go into the national system now would be, I think, a little bit too early. Thanks a lot, Jasper. Um, I would directly give it to uh, to Brigitte. Maybe, uh, as I understood, we, uh, we heard that national systems are third best at, uh, at best, but they might be the most pragmatic approach and uh, uh, better than doing nothing. Uh, let's start uh, building at least something on a national level. Would you agree on that? Or? I would somehow agree, but I think we need a broader EU perspective. So my starting point uh, would be the um, the binding targets in the non-ETS sectors. So we have the effort sharing directive that uh, gives us binding yearly budgets for the sectors for transport, for uh, heating and also for agriculture. Um, and, and so I think this is um, at the EU level, this is for every country in the EU and they all have to deliver on these national binding targets. And so therefore I would say, um, yes, we already somehow from the political constraints, we are already somehow set for different national systems um, to start with that. But then I think the perspective until or towards 2030 should be that from 2030 onwards, we should think of a joint system. So. Um, in, in two directions. So one is um, at the European scale, right, so that we have really a European system from 2030 onwards and also then have a joint system between the current ETS, so um, it, it's mainly electricity and industry, and the non-ETS with transport heat and perhaps agriculture is a bit separated. But I would really say that um, we need we, we need national entry points now because also in Germany we have the debate how to deliver the 2020 targets or then 2021, 2022, these binding national targets. So we need a national entry point. But we should do this in such a way that we at the same time also start talks with neighboring countries and at the EU level so that we have a European perspective for uh, 2030. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I think one, one step in between could be to start with a coalition of the willing, so either on a tax system or a trading system, that might also be a um, perspective. May, may I directly give that back to you, because uh, what, uh, what I uh, heard Brigitte saying was that um, it would make sense in the, in the non-ETS sector to have national approaches, but in the ETS sector to, to maintain a European approach with a view in the non-ETS sector to have a European approach after 2030. Now, what I understand you saying is that uh, the Netherlands currently has a, uh, develops an approach in the ETS sector on top of something European that already exists? Uh, yes, we do. In, in the electricity sector, we do, because we will introduce a, a minimum level uh, floor in, in, the, in the price. Uh, also to enhance the investment certainty for, for companies. And in industry, um, well, the system will be somewhat complicated, um, but we will, we, we first have a quantitative target and we'll uh, make use of the elaborate system of the trading, EU trading system um, to work out uh, prices um, for companies that do not meet their quantitative targets. So if you can still follow that the quantity and reduction uh, of CO2 emissions is first, but if you do not meet those targets, you will be punished price-wise um, and you will, you will be taxed. Yeah. Um, I should add um, that, in the, for example, in the field of transportation, um, we will also introduce an aviation tax um, and, and we're trying to look for a coalition of, of countries that already have such a, an aviation tax and, and to expand the group. Um, so you see also in the field of transportation some bottom-up movement, which I think is positive. Lapo, um, so European co uh, uh, coalition of countries, national, um, I'm sorry on that. Um, uh, Georg, let, let, me, let me start by saying, because you mentioned my, my background and my uh, role actually 
Uh, I think, first of all, the energy companies uh, are aware to be a big part of the problem, but I, they are, I mean, keen in uh, being part of a solution. So we, uh, we uh, attend this public debate that is, that is taking place with a full awareness of what we can do, and you know that there are a number of initiatives in which uh, the big uh, major and super major are uh, involved, OGCI and, and many others. Uh, so, uh, I would like to, this is a typical debate in which uh, you can have very divisive narratives, uh, pessimistic or optimistic, where we are, what, what we need to, to meet the target. And I understand that this is a, this audience is, uh, is very well educated on the subject, on the topic. But I think it could be useful to uh, uh, very briefly recap where we are in this, in this respect. Uh, because, uh, to cut the long story short, it's, it's clear that we are still very far from the final destination, uh, very far from. But I would like to, to start with a more positive note on, on what is happening uh, in last year and this year in many parts of the world. Uh, because if we, if we, if we want to, uh, let's say, uh, describe the state of play, uh, we have actually uh, 57 uh, initiatives worldwide in terms of carbon pricing. Um, 28 of them are regional cap and trade mechanism, and 29 are carbon taxes applied at the national level. Uh, and uh, what is more important to, to underline is that 11 out of this uh, 27 came out in, 20, in 2018 and 2019. And if we uh, very rapidly uh, we scroll down uh, the, the, the most important initiative, I would like to emphasize uh, a, couple of the, a couple of those. Uh, first of all, China. Uh, we know that China is, is a game, can be a game changer, uh, the biggest emitter, but uh, the country that in one single year was able to install 55 out of 94 gigawatt of renewable energy. Uh, will implement next year uh, uh, the first uh, uh, carbon price about power sector. We have a very, very mixed feeling about the U.S. debate. Uh, last year in the midterm, uh, many proposals were defeated in the ballot, but you know that we have a number of initiatives taking place in many relevant uh, states, at the, not at the federal level. It's not only the well-known case of California, we have New Mexico, Oregon, uh, uh, Washington State, a lot of different mechanisms. Uh, there is something very interesting happening in Canada uh, where we have the implementation of a carbon floor price at the federal level, uh, the so-called backstop. We have a couple of, uh, with two different uh, interdependent systems, one ATS mechanism on power generation and industrial production, and a carbon-based fuel charge on fossil fuels. And this is interesting because some other Regional initiatives are happening in Nova Scotia, in Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, Saskatchewan, Prince Edward I I Island. We have initiative in Singapore. Uh, not forget that we have the first African initiati initiative on carbon price, South Africa. Uh, so something is interesting because it's clear that today uh, uh, this kind of uh, initiative are covering only the 20% of the global emission. But you can say, okay, we are very far from, from the target, but it's interesting that most of the relevant players are moving in the right direction. Uh, um, number two, uh, I guess that today uh, the um, carbon price in, in our European system is 25 euro for ton, just today. Uh, IMF says that at a global level we are stuck at two dollars, so it's nothing, it's uh, really peanuts. Uh, so it's not only about letting the market uh, go ahead, we need some political mechanism in order to implement a, a good framework uh, to push ahead uh, uh, national government, institution, the debate, civil society, companies to move forward. And so what we are looking at is uh, what is going to happen at the next COP25 in Santiago, because it's clearly that you know very well that the, uh, the three mechanisms provided by the Article 6 in the Paris Agreement, I mean, this, that, that, that's the key point. Uh, Katowice and, 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 and Bonn were not able to provide uh, a right framework to, uh, to push uh, the debate ahead, but we think that that is the, uh, will be the key point of a debate. So, last but not least, uh, uh, because this is where we are, uh, because uh, one of the questions is what we need to do. Uh, my message, our message, uh, I'm talking on behalf of my company, but it's clear that 
this could be uh, maybe also a voice representing more broadly uh, what the industry is is uh, uh, is sending as a message to the governing bodies in the EU is that uh, I think, and maybe we will talk later on about the Ursula von der Leyen ideas on, on, on the Green Deal, uh, I think that we need to spend uh, at least uh, the same uh, amount of political capital to, to make an outreach outside the EU. Uh, because it's clear that we, we can be, as we, are, as we have always been, the forefront of a debate, uh, but I think that we have to take profit from this mushrooming of initiatives that are taking place in the world and to push uh, the European bodies to make a, a, a better outreach uh, outside EU in order to have a mechanism in which uh, most of the relevant players can identify themselves. Because this will help not only the uh, global level of awareness about the climate change challenge, but also uh, to provide uh, mechanism transparent in terms of uh, uh, how you measure, uh, you verify uh, the emissions and you install uh, the right framework in order to uh, to let this all all of these mechanisms go ahead. Well, uh, you're a diplomat. Can I can I ask you? Uh, You know, the mushrooming is what, we, what is happening. So this is just the description of reality. Uh, uh, you know that every time you, uh, uh, you, you know the, the, the issue from Norhouse about the, the, the climate clubs. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a stick and carrot, I, 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 I would say toolbox. Because if you uh, behave every day like the best in class and you just uh, wait for other follow, 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 follow you, uh, this can also provide some backlash. Uh, it happened in the past. So when I'm talking about outreach, uh, I think that we can provide as Europeans the best examples, but we have to be inclusive in trying to get on board some other actors. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, m my feeling, this is not the only case, uh, also in my experience in Brussels, is that sometimes in, in the Brussels bubble, uh, everything is focused on our best performance as Europeans. But then the big issue is how you involve other uh, members to join the club uh, and 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 to to be like-minded. So I think that we 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 need to understand the signals that are coming from big emitters and big countries. And so uh, I mean, climate clubs could be in, in this case the solution. So to to try to to get on board uh, all those actors who are like-minded like us. Yeah. Um, I'd like to follow up on that. So I th see different levels and also different levels on, on, on ambition. So at the international level, um, I see more a question of joint learning, cooperation, platforms, exchange and so on. So this is to be transparent about carbon pricing. I mean, in the G20, there is, for example, this um, subsidy. It's, it's a peer-to-peer um, -peer review between two countries on fossil fuel subsidies, for example. Um, and this has worked between China and, and the US and I think um, Mexico and Germany and so on. And I could imagine something like this for carbon pricing. So really to put on the table because we have some implicit carbon prices in the in the energy system and so on. So um, to talk about wh where are the implicit carbon prices happening, wh wh what is your system and so on. So this might um, um, sum up to joint learning. Actually at the EU level I, I would be more ambitious and um, Again, I would separate it um, between the ETS sector that we have and the non-ETS sector. And in the ETS sector, I, I think only a joint European approach is, is somehow reasonable. So therefore, I, I would like to um, understand a bit better if you have an additional tax in the ETS system, so in, in the um, for industry and, and also for um, electricity. I was wondering, I mean, in the end, um, so even with the market stability reserve, the water bed e effect is not fully gone. So probably you're then financing that Germany can have a longer coal 
um, um, that coal power plants can run longer. So I, I was wondering, uh, what's the um, mechanism behind, and will you take out certificates? Um, so this is in the ETS sector where I clearly see we need a European approach. And then in the non-ETS sector, I think we can start with national approaches and, and come to a, to a joint system in 2030. Actually, actually, I grabbed the microphone to first pose a question to you, and uh, Mr. Pistelli, uh, because I, I recognize your description of what's going on and, and all the different initiatives, uh, mushrooming, you called it. But could you be somewhat more precise on what do you propose um, and how do you value it? I, I think from your second uh, remarks, I, I sense that you do not value it positive, that you, you, you think it's positive that it happens, but for a company like yours, it's not easy to deal with it. But I'm, I'm still puzzled. What 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 is your no, no, proposal? No, 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 it's not about uh, the perception of uh, the single perception of the company. Just just to give just to give a, a, a very short insight about I mean uh, who we are and where we where we, we we produce as E and I. But I mean uh, maybe uh, you, you can diversify the description uh, of the European companies by looking at their portfolio. Uh, we are very much involved in, in in the issue of the carbon neutrality when we when we are talking about Europe. Uh, uh, focusing on our chemical branch, but as an upstreamer, uh, we are producing 85% uh, of our portfolio outside Europe. So we have to, to take into account what's happening everywhere because, I mean, we are mostly Africans and, and we know that Africa is lagging behind not only in terms of emission but also of regulatory framework. Uh, so we, we, we try to be part of a debate because we feel we 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 uh, we feel obliged to do our part uh, in in the in the um, climate change uh, challenge and the energy transition game, but it's clear that we we can look at that from many different angles uh, because we are Europeans uh, at the headquarter level, uh, but our production is not Europeans. Uh, if you make the exception of what we are doing uh, under the chemical branch, uh, this is this is the reason why I'm trying to I'm not diplomat. <laughs> in this respect, it, it, is that it, it depends on the on the on the shoes that you are wearing, uh, very, very simply. Uh, so, and this is the reason why you you will find European companies being more, I would say, uh, ambitious in terms of their uh, climate change strategy and long term strategy, uh, with respect with a lot of national oil company working in the Middle East or a lot of American companies, because the European companies feel more than others obliged to do their part uh, in, in this challenge. But if you are looking merely uh, from the, uh, our budget perspective, it's clear that we, we are accustomed to work from the South of Africa to the Far East uh, to, the, to, the, to the North America, in which the regulatory framework and the, and the national uh, push are so different. So we need to be, in this respect, diplomats, because it's, it's such a variety of menus that we have to deal with. Okay, uh, I, I would like to come back a bit to the to the initial question on national versus uh, versus European, and uh, essentially uh, just put Brigitte's question uh, back to you. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the Netherlands now essentially financing uh, uh, cheap emissions in uh, uh, outside the Netherlands uh, with that mechanism, or are you going to buy back allowances from the system with the uh, with the money you take? Um, well, this this question really relates to the electricity arrangement that we will uh, install. Um, I, I have to be uh, fair, um, we will introduce this, this minimum price, this floor price, January 1st next year, 2020. But it will be at a quite low level, I think about 12 euro. And, and our forecast, uh, no, moreover, our law will be that this minimum price will rise to almost 32 euro in 2030. So it, it provides a framework for industry, or in this case electricity producers, um, what will happen and they can adapt to it. Yes, there is a risk, uh, as you refer to, that um, all of our electricity will come from something that's not very ecologically sound. Um, we've made some studies on this and we've now, uh, according to these studies, they've been 
uh, very thorough and, and undertaken last year twice. Uh, we think that this will strike the right balance, but um, the effect could take place, as you uh, refer to, and I consider that a risk, but a risk we, uh, we dare to take. On kind of next on my list of questions, but very strongly related to that, uh, is, a, is an old economist's question of uh, whether a tax on carbon is better than a trading system. And we have seen both systems being developed, uh, sometimes in parallel as hybrid systems. And we have currently a very, very strong debate again on that in, in Germany. So um, maybe, Brigitte, you can give us some insights into the, uh, the German debate that we currently have. <coughs> Yeah, so, so the debate about uh, tax versus emission trading system, as you said, it's, it's a long-standing debate. In a sense, in a theory, they are equivalent. So either you have control of the price or you have the control of the quantity, but in principle, they de deliver the ki same kind of abatement. Um, so now, in, in practice, everything is a bit different. Um, actually, we just provided um, um, a study as an input for the German Climate Cabinet. There's also an English short version available on our website, at MCC's website. And we, we dig deeper into the questions, really, how to implement um, a, a carbon pricing system in Germany, especially for the non-ETS sectors, like uh, so especially transport and heat. So um, and so, if politicians go for a for a tax system, um, they have to find a mechanism how to adapt the tax from time to time. So I mean, either you could just um, fix a path for a longer period, but then you are not. Um, I mean, oil prices could rise or could be much lower than expected. So then you might or you um, need a mechanism to adjust this tax, right? So depending on how the economy is going. If, if we have a recession, what's currently debated at the global level, then you might want to adjust this tax. And for policymakers, it's, it's very hard to adjust this tax from year to year. But you need to find a mechanism. So it sounds very easy to, to, to give a fixed um, price path, but in the end, it's, it's not that easy um, at the implementation level. Um, for the uh, trading system, it's also difficult. Now, let's concentrate again on, on the uh, trading system for transport and heat, because we have these binding targets um, at the European uh, level in, in the effort sharing directive. So, as a policymaker, if you implement that, you're not. You, I mean, the ideas about which prices are needed in these sectors for transport and heat, they vary a lot. You see different studies, and we made also a kind of a systematic analysis of, of the different elasticities and, and what you need for a price to really reach that target. They vary a lot, and you, we came up with ranges between 70 and 350 euro. I mean, no poli policymakers can, can communicate that, right? So if you implement um, a trading system, a national, or also at the European level, um, a, a trading system for transport and heat, for example, um, w we would suggest to implement also a price collar. So a minimum price, so that at least the investors have a signal, okay, that's the way to go, that's somehow um, uh, reliable, and this is the price path uh, we can expect. So you also said you have this price path for expectations, so we would also say then start with a minimum price. And we also argue for a price ceiling because um, if you implement such a new system, so price price can be quite high, right? So you have to um, somehow assure against that uh, that the price price are too high. And in a sense, you could say with this price collar, the narrower the collar is, the more it is a tax. And therefore, also this long-standing debate between tax and emission trading system, I, I think it has been somehow overcome or should be overcome because in political reality you would probably somehow um, or you can um, arrange them and design them in such a way that they are somehow similar. And also when we look to the US, um, at least I mean from, from German economists the debate is sometimes very pure just you have either a tax system or an emission trading system but in, in the end, in, in the American also economic community, they are much more open, they have this hybrid system, and I think this is the way to go to make the best of, of both systems. Um, 
So um, just one one um, flavor of the German debate currently. I was uh, yesterday joining uh, the debate from the Christian Democrats. Um, they had a so-called Werkstatt. Workshop. Workshop. Yeah, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, it's more hands-on ha crafting crafting workshop, right, on on carbon pricing and the energy system as a whole. And um, the tendency was to go uh, towards a national. Um, um, emission trading system for transport and heat, while the Social Democrats are more in favor of a tax, so it might be that a kind of compromise is then in a hybrid system. So let's see how, how this turns out, but currently in Germany debate is, is very, very lively. Um, well, we ended up with a, a dual system, actually. Um, I was still puzzled by a word, workshop. I think the, probably the modern term would be a hackathon. Um, but, but anyway, um, it was very analog. Okay. Um, now, we have, a, we have, of course, the same issues. And, and if in a perfect market, in a perfect world, you would have the proper information to set the price or the tax right, but we don't know. And, and we have seen that the price um, in the trading systems have been very volatile, and, and you refer to the large dispersion between the world price of two and the current price of 25 around. Um, so that is an issue uh, for us as well. Um, so given the fact that we don't have full information on what a good price would be, we start with the quantitative target and develop price paths that can be adjusted uh, like once every two years um, in, the, in the course of the coming 10 years. Uh, that's, so that's how we try to strike the balance between these two uh, difficulties. Would you as a company representative have any preferences of the uh, one system or, uh, or the other or is that not an... Uh, question for I hope that you are giving me this role, but I have not been elected as a representative uh, of, the, of the industry as a whole. So uh, you have to imagine that usually uh, I, 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 I put in these terms uh, because maybe I mean uh, you are biased by by my by, by my background from this point of view. Uh, even in in our uh, core industry, we are not price maker. We, we are price taker. So we have to follow the rules. We we see what's happening. Uh, we have a commitment about uh, uh, the transition, but we have to be compliant with the rules that are applying in every uh, regional or national framework. So you, 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 can't, you can't say I have preferences on one mechanism or on one other. I can tell you, uh, maybe we will talk later on about that, uh, which, which could be opportunities and, and risk of a mechanism or another if you have to... Uh, to, to, to modify your portfolio and being compliant with different rules but I mean we are not uh, rule makers in this respect we are we are just looking at the debate uh, giving our suggestion and, and then we will see what's happened but 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 would a company like you and I be agnostic towards a, a well-designed tax versus a well-designed um, trading system um, or would you have uh, any preferences that are clear because of your risk profile or uh, uh uh, I, th I, th I think that uh, the, the kind of uh, the kind of risk that you are mentioning is in, uh, in in the companies like ENI is more general is more on a higher level it's about uh, uh, this it's not so technical take it I put it bluntly uh, I don't see in the medium and even in the long term an industrial risk from this point of view what I see and this is one of the reasons why we uh, participate to this kind of, of debate is the kind of social reputation that the industry has in the debate about the transition and, and climate change challenge. Uh, then we, we will follow the rules that we will implement it. What we see as an industry uh, is that in order to have a, a, a working mechanism, we have to solve a lot of technical issues in terms of uh, accounting, measuring and verifying uh, the, the units of carbon emission. Because if you, if you want to market and if you want rules that are not simply uh, uh, political and vocal messages, but something that you, you can work on it, 
uh, you need to, to to make a lot of steps ahead. And we hope that Santiago can be, I mean, uh, a, a step in order to move forward the debate of the Katowice and Bonn. That's it. Yeah, just to follow up on, on, on one issue about uh, rules and verification, I think in terms of implementation, a carbon tax might be easier, um, especially when you implement it not as a separate tax, but just over the energy taxes. I mean, this is the way how we does discuss it in Germany and add on on the energy taxes. Um, and that, that's a quite, in a sense, a quite easy channel because you do not have to change the law and so on. For the emission trading system to set up a, a new emission trading system is much more challenging because you also have to negotiate about ex, ex, um, um, exceptions and also um, monitoring and then also um, financing rules as a certificate, uh, a finance market instrument and so, and so on. So in, in, in terms of setting up a system, um, an easier way would be uh, with a carbon price. Maybe I, I would come to to my uh, next question, which is on the um, kind of we now discussed different stages of granularity: national, European, uh, bit tax trading, and now the another step is a sectoral versus uniform. So here the question is essentially: um, w Would it not make sense to have the same carbon price across all sectors? Because we are now discussing about uh, questions like sector coupling, where where essentially you can shift uh, energy for transport, heating, and and uh, and other sectors. So would it not make sense to have one single carbon price for all of those, uh, or is that impractical? Because they might have different elasticities and it might be more sensible and politically feasible to have very sectoral carbon prices. Um, Brigitte, what's, what's your take? Yeah, I mean, here I clearly see a tension between um, economists and practitioners because economists would always argue for the most efficient system, effective, uh, efficient system with one uniform carbon price um, across all sectors. And um, practitioners disagree, and um, I think they have also good reasons to do that. Um, we also have, or let, let's start with the political constraints. I mean, um, so we currently have divided systems between ETS and non ETS systems. And, um, <coughs> and this, <coughs> sorry. Assume if, if we have the same price in both systems, that might mean um, that we see, or if, if we put everything, every um, uh, all sectors into the European emission trading system, for example, prices would be higher. Let's say 10 to 15 euros higher. Then we would see a strong signal for stronger coal phase out. So some countries won't be affected, like. France, for example, but, but Germany and Poland will, of course, be affected. And then we have the political debate about that. I mean, in, in Germany, we just found a coal compromise when to phase out coal. But now, if we would, would argue for a um, um, uniform price in that system, uh, that would mean that the pressure on coal will be much stronger. So economically, this makes sense. But then you have to negotiate with the people living in the coal regions. And I mean, last Sunday, we had regional elections and the right-wing party in Germany won 27% of the votes. And this is also the reason of this debate on the coal phase out. So uniform prices is, is something Sounds very nice, but it has also some practical consequences. So this is the political part. Then the technical part is um, that I somehow have the feeling that people, um, they say, well, we need higher prices in the transport system, in the transport sector, because we, we have technologies that need a higher price to come in, right? Um, perhaps this is not the right argumentation because they have some, some technologies in mind that they would like to see forward and then they argue for a high, high price. This is probably not, not the right way to argue, um, but we, we don't know which technologies will come in, um, but yeah, so, so therefore um, this is, th or that's an argu argument from the practitioners for different prices in different sectors. Um, I was taught to be an economist. I've been in the civil service maybe for too long, um, but I, I don't think um, from an economic point of view you, you can um, really argue that you need one price because you have to, this is only the case if all the production factors will be completely mobile, the 
the world would, would be completely integrated or if you're in a completely closed economy and neither cases are really realistic. So I think I agree with your statements even as an economist. Is the, uh, is the planned um, aviation, uh, is the planned aviation um, uh, carbon price, uh, will that be different from the uh, carbon price for industry and uh, uh, electricity? Uh, yes, it will. We, um, for the aviation tax, we, we took a very uh, brave measure uh, to put it only uh, as a ticket tax. So it's, it's simple, um, and I think from the theoretic point of view, not optimal, but um, it's very practical. Um, that I forgot, I have to be fair. Per ticket. Per ticket, yeah. Um, seven euros. I, I think it was seven, but it has been debated, but let's stick to the seven. Um, the yes, yeah. And then we left out freight, so we will introduce also a system for freight, um, which is important, uh, certainly in the Netherlands, we have a lot of foodstuffs uh, going into airplanes. Um, Lapo, if you either you comment on that or I come to the next question, which is to you, uh, um, then um, <laughs> the, um, you already started to discuss a bit on the on the international dimension and that uh, that Europe, we heard before, is only ten percent of global emissions and that. Uh, uh, that there certainly is a risk of uh, of leakage that has been discussed. So the, the word carbon border adjustment was mentioned uh, by uh, by Simone before. Um, what is your take? How do we get the other players on board with the uh, uh, with following our example? What are the uh, the sticks and uh, and carrots that we uh, that we might potentially have? This is the question that could be uh, that should be raised to the policymakers because I mean I, I see as European so as a European citizen let me as a European well-informed citizen no more than that uh, I, I am proud to uh, belong to a region in the world which is I mean uh, uh, looking long-term vision trying to strive for a, for a clean energy it, that's good. Then, if I see uh, all of the all of the mechanisms that are implied in this kind of discussion, uh, I, I, I said already before, I see that sometimes the risk is what is technical, uh, perfect, economically fair, perfect. Sometimes it doesn't become politically feasi uh, feasible, uh, because at the end of the day, we know uh, this is the uh, political atmosphere that we are living in in the last few years. Every uh, issues which can become national or European uh, implies the issue, the issue of sovereignism, of, of, the, of, the, of the power that you are giving uh, somewhere else. And this is a very tricky issue. This is a very tricky issue. We, mention, we, we didn't mention uh, right now one of the things which is uh, maybe more, more sexy or interesting also in the uh, proposal uh, put forward by Ursula von der Leyen about the Green Deal, the, the, the border adjust mechanism. I mean, something which is very, it is very tricky. Uh, on the one hand, you know that the technical and the economical, uh, the economic rational behind that is very strong. Is very strong. It is not the first time that we are mentioning this kind of uh, uh, tool uh, in the European debate. It's uh, President Hollande started a couple of years ago. Uh, then you had President Macron uh, calling for, the, for for that again. If you go on the other side of Atlantic, you see Joe Biden uh, talking about that, and also some Republicans joining on that debate. Then you go back to reality and you say, how many countries uh, did it? No one. Why? Because it's so tricky from a political point of view, it's so slippery, that you need to uh, take back that kind of mechanism at, a, at least at a regional level. So what I see, but this is a, a very common sense advice, please uh, let's spend at least uh, the same amount of political capital not only to make a perfect proposal but to make outreach on, 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 your, on your neighbors and on your big emitters. What I would think, uh, maybe uh, this could be a very powerful uh, tool, uh, it's about the free trade agreement that uh, the EU is negotiating uh, with third parties. I mean, we have uh, sometimes uh, uh, included in, in free trade agreements a lot of other stuff you know, uh, less for less, more for more, human rights, civil society, why not? 
if you want, include also and involve issues related to climate change and to carbon tax. But this is, a, this is just a suggestion. If you see, uh, uh, even in the, in the proposal made by, by von der Leyen, when she's talking about this kind of mechanism, but, but she refers to a mechanism uh, WTO compliant. So tricky. How, how, how can you do that? Uh, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the state of play of uh, the WTA, uh, WTA de debate. So I, I think that stick and carrot mean, means that. I mean, uh, we must behave as a club in which uh, uh, everybody would like to join. Uh, and so we did it in the past, uh, looking at the other, other chapters, other domains. Maybe this could be one of the ways. Uh, but we will see if the next commission, if they're able to involve, even in the free trade agreement, something related to climate change. That could be. Or carbon tax. Have international competitiveness considerations been a part of the, of the discussion in the, in the Netherlands on the, on the carbon tax? Of course, very much. We are a very open economy. Um, um, have... Uh, many multinational companies that produce for, for many, many markets. Uh, so yes, that has been uh, a very important element um, for our national deliberations. And, and on, on a more abstract level, as we discussed, as you were discussing it right now, I would be very cautious to introduce these elements. Um, and I, I would argue that, well, my study was about the politi political e economy of protection, and there you see that over the course of the years, every time there are these type of arguments to introduce trade distortions. And right now we are in the midst of a great number of trade distortions, uh, so I would, I would be very cautious to introduce this in the, the debate. It is introduced, but let's uh, stay quite away from it. Yeah. Um, I, I cannot provide you with an immediate answer uh, for on a on a European level, but on a national level, um, I can say something more uh, on what I already said on our carbon uh, tax that we will introduce in industry. Because if if this tax um, will result in tax revenues, in the best case it doesn't because in the best case all the companies will reduce their uh, emissions and we will have no revenue at all but if we uh, will gain revenues then we will immediately give those um, revenues back in the form of subsidy to to change the companies that are uh, not able to change or that have a really fierce international competition so that's a way to have a stick and carrots um, on a national level. But it would be much better to have it on a larger level. Yeah, I'm, I'm also a bit skeptical about uh, border carbon adjustment. I mean, it sounds so nice, but it's not at all easy to implement. And uh, this is not only for the reasons to be uh, WTO um, 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 conf conform, but also for two other reasons. So the first one is um, when you have a tax on imported goods, for example, you need to measure the carbon um, that is in there, right? So the embedded emissions, what are the embedded emissions? And, and this is not easy to track. In the end, you would have to do... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that, that might be an idea, but otherwise you, you would have to um, measure the embedded emissions in, in each traded good. And the second point is, um, I think the first step should be how, how large is the carbon leakage at all. I mean, for, for the emission trading uh, sectors, we have analyzed that and the leakage rate is not, not very high. I mean, this is probably also because the, the price was very low in, in, in recent years. So let's see how, how this develops. And I would also assume that for the sectors in transport and heating, the leakage rate is also not so high because you cannot escape that much, right? So, so the first step should be to have a proper analysis of the leakage effects and, and then to, to think what can be done in, in terms of border carbon adjustments or what, whatever. So you already mentioned that, um, uh, that the Netherlands is giving 
back some money to companies. Uh, now, uh, uh, Simone in his uh, in his speech uh, alluded to the uh, gilet jaune and uh, uh, to uh, to social issues linked to um, decarbonization and um, carbon pricing in particular. Um, are there some provisions in the Netherlands? Have you, uh, to, to which degree, have you have you thought about uh, the the distributional effects of uh, of carbon prices in? Uh, and how do you plan to essentially recycle the the revenues from uh, from the uh, from the tax? Um, those are quite quite a few questions. Um, well, first, I think we have to make this, this distinction between the different sectors where um, you do apply a, a carbon tax. And as I mentioned, we actually leave out quite a number of sectors. Agriculture is exempted, and housing and construction as well. Um, we do have ambitious targets for those sectors, but we try to reach them in a different manner. Transport is, to a large part, also excluded, uh, apart from this aviation tax, but that is, I think, small if you, if you look at uh, the carbon impact they have. And then, um, in the field of electricity, um, we int introduced this minimum tax or the, this floor price um, and the past one and a half years has been a very very fierce debate in, in the Netherlands uh, on the impact on households uh, like the Gilets Z Jaunes um, and what we do is we um, we compensate especially lower income households um, and even um, which is doesn't sound so nice but we we felt we had no choice to, to make it happen. We even increase the exemption uh, at the base, so uh, the first part of your energy consumption is still exempt. Um, and from our ambitions in the field of carbon tax, we wanted to min diminish that. That was also in the coalition agreement two years ago. Uh, but we have abandoned uh, our endeavor at that part and rather raise it again. Industry is a, is a uh, a different case. Uh, I think I already mentioned some of the, the ways we, we try to compensate and we try to look at the competitive effects. Um, we already have in place uh, a subsidy scheme, um, quite smart subsidy scheme, where you get subsidy according to the, um, how do you say that, uh, the change or, um, in, um, in carbon emission that you make. So we will essentially just kick in more money into that scheme. Brigitte, as an, uh, as an economist, so you, you essentially you can spend carbon revenues, uh, I, I would list three things. You can spend them to invest in, uh, in green technology to, to reduce essentially the, the cost of decarbonization. You can use them to compensate companies in order to uh, help with international competitiveness, or you can give them back to, to people in order to uh, ensure social justice. Uh, how many percentage for each of those? Oh. Um. So then, then I repeat the question, what, what, what to do with the revenues? There are actually um, um, different channels how to give it back. So you have um, industry, you have uh, um, households, and you have uh, yeah, investment that would be um, giving it back to the government in, in a sense, right? So um, I would say households and industry that can be um, that can be distinguished or can be separated, and you can find channels for each. So we we looked into the international dimension and and found that all the three major channels are be being used, right? Um, I, I would like to concentrate on on the households because. Currently in, in Germany, the discussion on uh, rising electricity prices or ri rising uh, the, the prices through a carbon price is um, is very strongly related um, to the question how to um, give the money back to avoid that poorer households are overly affected. And there are uh, mainly three channels are being discussed. So one is giving it back on a per capita basis. This is the, the Swiss model, and in Germany, everybody likes the Swiss model, giving it back on a per capita basis. Um, the second model that is being discussed is um, lowering um, electricity prices, so either uh, getting rid of the electricity uh, tax or, or um, um, 
decrease the electricity tax or um, finance the feed-in tariff system uh, from um, f uh, through that man money because currently only the households pay the feed and tariff system and it's quite interesting to th to see the political debate about that so uh, it started off that the per capita um, redistribution was the most attractive and mainly put forward also from the environmental minister um, that's a social democratic uh, ministry um, but actually now we see that we do not have a, um, a channel so we do not have um, uh, the Swiss. Uh, Sw Switzerland has a um, each person has a health insurance in Germany as well, but we have the separation between private and um, 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 public system. So we do not have the same channel, and so it it might be the case that we do not find a channel how to give it back. That's that also kind of administrative and re regulative detail, but if you really want to implement such a system, you have to think about these little details. So perhaps the per capita redistribution is, is, is not working. Um, what will probably work is um, to, to lower electricity um, um, taxes, other electricity taxes, that might also be a good idea to um, facilitate sectoral coupling, so between electricity sector and the transport sector, and it would also help poorer households because they have a higher share of, um, of, of their consumption is, is giving out for energy, so if you lower the um, electricity prices, that's also quite fine. This is the, the channel that the Christian Democrats are more or less in favor of. And then the third channel that you mentioned to, to um, go for green investments or investments into um, um, power to, um, to X technology and so on. This is mainly put forward from, from the industry, but also from a lot of NGOs, because they, they like this targeted funding of uh, um, um, support programs and, and so on. So these are the three channels that are discussed. Uh, may I add one comment on that? Because I think uh, it's a very interesting debate. Uh, and I think that, frankly speaking, if we want to uh, increase the level of awareness uh, of the of the final destination of the carbon pricing and how you can involve uh, the, the global population, the public, the, the, audience, the public audience to, 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 to this kind of strategy, uh, you need to uh, target very well uh, the potential revenues of the, of the carbon pricing. So I would be, as a voter, skeptical in uh, getting back that revenues in, in the whole budget and in the general budget for providing services because, I mean, there's the general level of taxation which, which is useful for that. I would, be, uh, I would be more interested on the one hand, uh, especially in those countries, it's not the case of my country as Italy, but uh, in the case of some countries which, which are more affected by the transition, uh, that's the case from the coal, coal phasing out in, in, in Germany, or in, in Eastern Europe. First of all, to take care of the social and political implication of the areas and the workers who are losing their position. Uh, otherwise, I mean, there are something. There, are, there are some sectors and some people and some regions which will be punished, personally punished by by the transition. You have to help them, like we are doing every time and everywhere. You have a, a se an industrial sector which is particularly affected by a transformation of the economy. Uh, and secondly, I think that you have to invest more. And, and it's interesting that N NGOs and industry are converging on that, in research and development and and all technologies that ca that can give you. I mean, the, the, the sense of the direction you're, you're marching toward. This is interesting. I, I would be very skeptical in, uh, in just uh, merging that kind of revenues in something which is not very well targeted. I think this, this can be a good trigger from a political point of view. Also to, uh, let's say, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to make the hot potato a little bit colder. You know what I mean? Otherwise, you have those who are the, the victims of a transition and those who are uh, flagging the transition. And, and this is really risky from a political point of view. So with that, I would be through my list of questions. I see a lot of uh, people that participate in, uh, in those discussions here in Brussels and beyond very regularly. And I think it would be great to, uh, to have some of uh, your views and, and questions. I think we have uh, some 15 minutes or so left. Uh, I think, uh, Joss. Uh Thank you very much, and congratulations with the discussion. My name is uh, Joss Delbeke. I was the former Director General for DG Climate Commission. I have a comment and I have a question. 
The comment is to uh, Mr. Pistelli. I would uh, strongly agree that we need outreach on carbon markets. And uh, today the European University in Florence is functioning that and is uh, setting up a big project with the World Bank and the European Commission to do that towards G20 countries. I think we have a good lesson that we teach our friends in, uh, in Asia, and in particular in China. What is happening there is really a game changer. So I would strongly agree to that. And I would also strongly agree to the regional impacts and the sectoral impacts, because people are frightened when carbon markets are coming their way, if they are co living from coal mining or activities like that. Uh, but my question is to Mr. Wesseling. Mr. Wesseling, um, I think that the comment was made by uh, Mrs. Knopf that uh, the environmental result of an electricity tax may be minimal, even if not existing. So why were you not in the Netherlands considering reducing free allocation under the ETS? Because free allocation is a, is a gift that is fairly generous to uh, companies covered by the ETS. And so that could be a quite important revenue effect that you may generate from ETS, as well as possibly in the long term an environmental result. And my related question to that is, why are you so obsessed about electricity and industry and not so much about transport and heat? Because it is in transport and heat that uh, it will be very difficult for the Netherlands, according to all estimates, to deliver the target for 2030. So why? concentrating on the issue that is best covered and why leaving behind the issue that is uh, likely to be the most problematic one in the perspective of 2030. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, to, to be frank, I'm obsessed with all sectors. Um, and so over here, I, I, I put emphasis on the two sectors where we are introducing carbon tax pricing, um, as is the, the, the theme of this uh, seminar. Uh, but yes, we have uh, large issues in the field of transportation. Um, actually, we will um, do a large overhaul of our private car system um, to make it um, really eco-sustainable um, and we w our target is um, to have 100% electricity vehicles or um, H, H vehicles at 2030. So n none fossil uh, cars anymore in 2030. And that's quite an ambitious target and we will overhaul in our fiscal system um, almost five to ten billion um, in the course of the years every year to steer um, all the the new to be sold cars in that direction so that's that's the first thing we do in in transport that will affect um, all people that do buy a new car and there are quite a few um, your question on the electricity um, sector. Uh, yes, I agree that's a very relevant uh, question. Um, I cannot go into all the deliberations that we had in our uh, political scene, um, but I think it's relevant to, to mention that at present uh, in the Netherlands, electricity is uh, to a large extent also produced by gas, uh, and as some of you might be aware, uh, our gas supplies in the north of the Netherlands uh, provoke earthquakes. Um, so we are shutting down um, that gas supply very soon and this has a, a huge impact, a huge transition uh, on our electricity pr production schemes. Um, so we are playing two games at one uh, and this is the balance that we eventually took. Um, but I do agree with uh, the points that you refer to. I would take uh, three questions. Okay, so thank you very much. My name is Giorgio, and I'm gonna stand up. Um, with the European Energy Exchange, um, we, we manage the, the auction platform uh, for the ETS, and I have two questions. One is from actually uh, Brigitte, about what you mentioned uh, on the fact that it, it may be easier to actually work on a tax rather than an ETS. 
But actually, my notion and where we're also coming from is that one of the reasons why we have an ETS in Europe is actually because it was easier to gather the support across the 28 member states on a trading system rather than on a tax. Um, and the second question is actually for Jasper about what you mentioned on uh, the aviation tax. So uh, uh, it may be naive, but um, what is the implication of having the consumers, basically those who travel, uh, pay the cost of the tax? And uh, is, is there any other alternative you foresee in actually taxing nationally an industry which is naturally global? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Nicolas Bakelmans from uh, ExxonMobil. Thank you very much for the invite. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Nicolas Bakelmans uh, from uh, ExxonMobil. Thank you very much for a very insightful uh, debate. Uh, as Mr. Baker, I have one comment and one uh, question. One comment to uh, Mr. Pistelli, uh, representing a US energy company. I believe I can say that we are as committed as any other European uh, company. Uh, I can list a lot of examples, but last week we came uh, as an example strongly out uh, against the federal government in the US uh, trying to get rid of the methane rules. They already 10 years ago, we were a big supporter of um, carbon pricing, carbon tax being uh, the most efficient way to achieve what we want to achieve. Uh, my question is about the debate on carbon border uh, adjustment. Uh, make um, uh, the current l uh, carbon leakage protection, protection the com protecting the competitiveness of uh, industry, is embedded in the ETS, uh, the free uh, allocation. You could indeed debate that about the, uh, the measure of carbon leakage until now in view of the current ETS price, but that's going to fade away. It, based on the commission assessment, that price is going to evolve to 2, 250, 200, uh, 300 euro per ton, coming closer to the 2050 ambitions. So taking that into account, uh, taking into account also what you have been saying, that it's tricky and difficult, what other measures, except border adjustment measures, could be put in place to protect competitiveness of European industry, taking into account the evolution of that price? Thank you. And then there's a third question in the, in the back. Tim. Thank you. Victor Joseph from Climate. I have a short and abstract question to all. Um, with Climates, we have developed a simulator model together with MIT Sloan School. It's a simulator model that calculates global average temperature rise through pulling levers uh, of different sectors, subsidizing or taxing different sectors. Among others, carbon pricing is one of these levers. And here's the abstract question to all. Uh, what do you think is a tangible, realistic, global carbon price per ton uh, that's in line with IPCC measures and it's a realistic one. So. Yeah, so I'd start with Giorgio's question, um, tax versus um, ETS, what is easier to implement? So I think it's important to distinguish between the national debate that we currently have and the European debate. So for, for Europe, I really see a perspective towards 2030 for a joint European emission trading system across all sectors, right? This would be a perspective. At the national level, now we have the debate in Germany that um, putting up a national ETS system for transport and heat, that would take about three years to implement, right? There are a lot of questions to be solved. And the government now simply, the, the pressure is so high in Germany. We have the Fridays for Future mo uh, movement. They are so strong and the government really fears that, um, that, that movement. So they cannot con come up with a suggestion and say, yeah, well, we have the idea of a non-ETS, um, of a non-ETS ETS, and that would take some time and so on. So they really need an answer now. So therefore, it might be the case that um, the entry point is uh, with a, you could say, a fixed price in 
an ETS or with a carbon tax because that might be easier to implement over the energy taxes. Um, then to the last question, I mean, um, there was this high-level commission on carbon pricing that was implemented by the World Bank and led by uh, um, Nicola Stern and Joe Stieglitz. And actually, uh, because my boss was also involved in there, I, I got a little, of, little bit of the background information. And um, it, it was very hard to come up with, let's say, one number, right? They analyzed different studies. They analyzed the... Um, um, the global integrated assessment models. They also analyzed regional models. And the third was that they um, analyzed, um, let, let's say, bottom-up technology perspectives. And what they came up with is, uh, for 2020, a range between 40 and 80 dollars per ton of carbon, and for 2030, the range of 50 to 100. And you can already see that this range is quite large, so there's not a single number. Uh, this is also the reason because you have to take into account the additional instruments, um, regulation and so on, and, and this, this is somehow a policy mix that you have to take into account, but this is the range um, that would be my answer to, to your question. No, very briefly, I, I agree on the last answer. I mean, I, I was just uh, reviewing some of the recent uh, studies available on, on that matter. And as far as we are debating, I mean, between the uh, cost and uh, opportunities about uh, focusing on narrow border, national solution, or global solution, regional solution, the same applies for this kind of debate. So if you, uh, for two reasons. First of all, because the numbers are so different. And then because there are a number of studies that uh, are not simply stating this could be a good price, but they say if you put this price, you could have this kind of consequences in terms of getting the targets. And, and it just uh, looking, I, 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 we just mentioned one, which is the IMF study, which came out in May this year. Uh, they are talking about a carbon price of $70 per ton in order to reduce the, uh, the emission by 33% on a global scale. But then they are also saying that if you, if you, if you set a $35 uh, uh, um, as a carbon price, these are going to impact the different sources in a very different way. 107 for coal, 33% for natural gas, 23% for electricity. So you have such a variety uh, of numbers. So it, it's so hard to define which is the price at the global level. I agree. Uh, picking up on that last point, I, I will not pinpoint the price, but I would like to uh, reiterate that it's important that you have a long-term uh, awareness and, and certainty about the way the price will be increased, which, assuming it will be increased. So that, I, I think, is the most important because that enables everybody, mainly industry, of course, to, to, to start uh, this transition, uh, really. Uh, I had a specific question on, on the aviation tax. Um, let, me, let me once again say this is certainly not a first best uh, instrument that we take. I think from an ecological point of view, the first best would be to tax the fuel. Um, but there's some debate that um, due to an international agreement that was uh, made in Chicago just after the war, uh, you're not allowed to tax fuel. Um, uh, I'm very much in favor of international agreements. This may be one that I'm not very much in favor of, even though I understand why they took that measure at the time. So that's why we moved away from fuel. Um, and then secondly, um, as you rightly mentioned, by nature, this is a very uh, international or global market. Um, so it, everything you do distorts the market very very swiftly, and therefore we had uh, to put in a price that's very low. I, I think we worked out that it's seven euro, um, which is low, it will not create a lot of revenue, it will not probably really, uh, given the elasticity, really induce people to stop flying. I think it, it can play an important element in uh, raising the awareness um, that flying is also uh, not very sustainable. Um, and 
uh, it makes it somewhat more fair compared to other sectors where we do tax uh, that type of impact. So it's certainly not first best, but it's something we, we, we do want to implement. We would like to implement it on a European level. Uh, that would be a step ahead. So far, uh, we had not reached agreement on that. So now we're trying to find a coalition with countries, member states that already have a, uh, such a tax and some others that might want to introduce it. And actually, we try to rally a, a group of like-minded for the next ECOFIN to uh, make a statement on that. I Ho hope we can make it. Thank you. Um, okay, then two last, um, three last questions and uh, please keep your questions short. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Walter Mönig and uh, I have a question uh, to Mrs. Knopf. In Germany, uh, we had uh, introduced the in so-called eco-tax in 1999 and a recent uh, study shows uh, that uh, this eco-tax was uh, from a climate policy point of view practically ineffective and the annual income from this tax uh, electricity tax and mineral oil tax is about 20 billion euros annually. So uh, what is the dimension uh, people in Germany think about a new carbon tax? Uh, should it be 20 billion or 200 billion? Or are we heading uh, to a carbon tax uh, which uh, don't bite? Uh, only a symbolic policy. And I do not share the optimism uh, that uh, a carbon tax is easy to implement, taking into account uh, the different uh, carbon taxes we have already. Uh, uh, think about uh, the difference between uh, diesel taxation and uh, mineral oil uh, in chemicals or uh, fuel, uh, uh, petrol, and so on. Um, then to adjust uh, the a fair carbon tax uh, would lead uh, to many, many different tax levels or uh, it would also lead to a number of tax exemptions taking into account international competitiveness. So uh, the fear is that we are heading to symbolic policy. Thank you. Hi. Um, Emma Pekar with the Wall Street Journal. The, uh, I had a question on the. Am I not supposed to go? Um, I had a question on the carbon pricing and the competition issues. Just wondering if everyone could expand on uh, those ideas a little bit. Currently, we're at uh, you know 25 euros and a little bit upwards, maybe. But uh, if carbon prices go, uh, you know, regularly about 40, 45 euros, a lot of analysts and economists say it will raise a lot of. <clears throat> competition issues uh, within the EU, uh, what's the best way for the EU to tackle some of those issues and prevent leakage internally, uh, let alone compete externally? Thank you very much. Thank you. Stefan Tobias, Community of European Railways here in Brussels. I've got a question uh, relating to the German debate, but also to the global picture and specifically to revenues. What strikes me in the German debate, I am German, that uh, is not only uh, the extraordinary efforts that center-right politicians especially make to avoid the word tax, because they, th they think they can't sell it to voters, but it's also the assumption naturally made that all revenues would necessarily stay forever in Germany, somehow contradicting what here in Brussels we call the uh, polluter pays principle. And uh, you could also make a, a, a normative case that on a, on, a, on a worldwide basis each citizen on earth should have the same carbon budget, who uh, pollutes more should pay, the others should get compensated. Uh, now we have to recognize that only 10% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions comes from Europe. So for European um, climate action to be effective, we need to get many more countries on board. And therefore my question is, when we are thinking of revenues, should Europe be not much more ambitious, much more 
bold, uh, approaching other countries, maybe inviting them, join us in, in, a, in a comprehensive ETS and we will share at least a part of ETS revenues uh, with you. That could be, say, 10% in 2030, it could be 50% in 2040 and maybe 100% in 2050 when, in any case, we in Europe want to be climate neutral. So a much bolder approach, recognizing <laughs> that revenue uh, raised here in Europe by a tax or the ETS uh, may not necessarily remain here if we want European climate action to be effective. Okay, so maybe the, the first question to, uh, to you. On yeah, perhaps very briefly because I think they are somehow related to, to the revenue issue. I, I would say it's very difficult to communicate this to voters. Um, I mean, there is this idea of a carbon club that you also mentioned, that also some economists put forward, and exactly what you said, to use the revenues to get others in the club. I, I think it's a very nice, fancy idea, but in the end, if you have to sell it to the voters, I, I'm a bit skeptical. Um, yeah, then on, on, on the... Um, on, on the German ecotix, I, I mean, um, it, for example, it was not inflation adjusted and so on, and, and, and the level was not that high. So what we propose, um, on, on the one hand, energy taxation um, must be put in a um, in a future system that is adjusted to to the um, or that energy taxes are related to to carbon prices, right? This is also what we propose that in the long term we have to have a different system. For example, if we phase out of, of fuels, you do not have the revenues from from that. So of course we have to take that into account. And concerning the level. Um, we suggest an, um, a price level of 50 euros where we would start with uh, increasing up to 130 euros in 2030. Let me put the last question to, to the two of you essentially. We had now this discussion on the, on the complexity of introducing uh, uh, carbon pricing and a lot of different questions uh, that need to be uh, need to be decided on that way. Do you think in the, uh, in the next five years inside Europe we will see a significant step forward in terms of carbon pricing towards the, uh, the levels that, uh, that you mentioned? Or do you think that's, uh, that the pace will be much slower than, uh, um, uh, than we would hope for? It's truly a personal opinion, I mean, uh, because you, you have to uh, answer depending on the political atmosphere that you're breathing here in Brussels. I think that starting a new mandate for a new commission with some bold ideas, one could be optimistic in this regard. So we think that, we think, I think that the political space devoted to this issue will be bigger than in the past. And, and I see that this is happening uh, not only because of the Brussels awareness of the relevance of the topic, but also because uh, uh, bottom up. Uh, this is uh, an awareness which is increasing so much. Uh, the big gap is what we have discussed in the last one hour and a half. So how you bridge the technical feasibility and the, I would say the ethical uh, commitment to that and how you sell it to the voters. And I think this is the, the, old, the, the, the same Brussels dilemma since the beginning. Uh, you have good ideas, you have good files, you have good rules, and then you have to sell it to the public. <laughs> this is the really big question mark here. Um, well, regarding the price, um, I think we will not influence the stock market from this room, uh, but I think the only way is up. Um, I think that, 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 that seems fair, um, but uh, other than that, I, I would feel um, very humble to give any fair judgment on, on to what level. I would like to add also uh, with respect to some questions about the revenues, I would like to make one point at the end of the seminar that uh, I think if all works out fine, the revenues will be very low because the companies and, and people will adjust their behavior and adjust their production and consumption, so revenues will be low. Um, I have to disappoint my colleagues in the Ministry of Finance with this statement almost every week uh, because they like to get in a lot of taxes, but um, I think we will not get in a, a large chunk of taxes through um, carbon pricing, uh, hopefully not. Um, and actually, I started my career at the Ministry of Finance introducing the first environmental taxes, uh, and at the time, 
people were already eager to introduce these taxes to raise the overall level, and now, 25 years later, um, we managed to increase the, the share of environmental taxes to almost 10%, not more than that. Um, so it's, it's not something you, should, as a policymaker, should think uh, it's, it's a cash cow. It's an instrument to influence behavior, hopefully, in the, in the right direction. Thank you very much. I, as a, as a moderator, would be happy that if you take from that debate essentially the following message, that indeed we have to do more on carbon pricing, and uh, it's essentially the case for that is very clear, that there is a lot of different decisions to be taken, and those um, kind of can go as a one direction or the other. We have answers to, uh, to most of those questions and the impacts on that. A lot of that just needs to be a politically implemented and a lot of the kind of discussion that we had were essentially around pragmatic approaches about uh, things that can be done politically and sold politically and most efficient approaches and the question now is kind of in which side the, the solutions will fall uh, but as Simona outlined before time is of the essence and uh, so we, we should all start working together in finding, kind of lining out the, the right menu of policies that, uh, that work together sensibly well to, uh, to quickly get to, uh, to more sensible levels of carbon pricing. I would like to, uh, to ask you uh, to, uh, to join me in applauding the, the great panelists. Uh, I found it a very interesting debate and uh, thank you very much.